All right, let me be real for a second. 25 year old Kevin was a savage, but now at 31, I'm soft as a Twinkie. Back in med school and residency, I was on a marathon of a grind. It was 10 hours a day, seven days a week, months on end, no break, didn't even break a sweat. Now I work hard for four days, sleeping eight hours each night, and I need to catch my breath on the fifth. So what was the secret to that grind and what can I learn from that to improve my current productivity? It actually comes down to my body chemistry. But to understand my body chemistry, we first need to explore my daily schedule. All right, so this is my med school schedule in the first two years of med school because your latter two, closure rotations, they can vary. I would wake up around 6.30 and I have my one hour morning routine that I love. So you can check that out right here. Bike to school around 7.30 for class at eight. Now, I would generally skip class. I would skip lecture from eight to 12, study on my own. Sometimes we did have small group lessons from 10 to 12, but normally we didn't. 12 to 12.30, scarf down food, scarf down lunch as quickly as possible. Maybe play a game or two of ping pong in the student lounge and then immediately bike over to the gym. And because I was always rushing, it was a pretty intense bike ride. Got my heart rate up, good warm up. And then at the gym, intense heavy lifting because I was trying to get swole, which clearly totally worked. Not. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. And you're not really fine. Then immediately after that, 2.30, I would bike back to the school, do some studying there with my friends. And then around six or seven, bike back home, maybe pick up food on the way, scarf that food down, seven to eight for dinner, and then eight to 10, do some more studying, 10 to 11, wind down and fall asleep by 11. Now I know a lot more now than I did back then, but if I tried that today, I'd be straight up exhausted. So what's changed? I only recently found out it's actually my physiology. Now, when we think of productivity and elevating our effectiveness in our lives, we normally turn to stimulants, things like caffeine. Red Bull gives you wings. But what the research is actually showing is that our enteric nervous system, our gut, the gut brain is actually hugely responsible. So believe it or not, there's actually a very strong link between your gut and your brain. Now let me give you an example. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's responsible for stabilizing our mood and our sense of well-being. By that logic, you might be thinking, okay, cool. Serotonin, neurotransmitter, mostly in the brain. You'd be wrong. 95% of the body serotonin is produced in the gut. And low levels of serotonin are actually associated with poor memory and depressed mood. And we know that's gonna kill your productivity. Now, the precise mechanisms between the gut brain connection do require further research, but the current literature shows that it's much more important than we previously thought. Another way your gut influences your productivity is actually through a food coma after you have a large carb heavy meal. So when you eat this highly processed, sugary, carb loaded heavy meal, your blood sugar rapidly spikes up. Now your pancreas is like, hold on, that's not good. It secretes a lot of insulin. And that insulin causes the blood sugar to actually get taken up by the muscles, the liver, the brain. So after your blood sugar spikes up, the insulin is causing it to get taken up, right? So it's dropping, but it drops too low. It drops lower than the prior baseline. And we call that reactive hypoglycemia. That is what is responsible for that lethargic feeling, that food coma that just kills your productivity. So how does this all relate back to my daily schedule? Well, unintentionally, I actually was doing a lot of things optimally that blunted these negative responses. Now, as for what I did right in medical school, there are four main things, and the first one is diet. So in the morning, I would either skip breakfast or I had this really massive meal replacement shake. And that meal replacement shake had healthy fats, either in the form of avocado or almond butter or peanut butter. It had complex carbohydrates in the form of whole fruits that were blended. I wasn't juicing, right? Because juicing removes the fiber. And I had protein, usually in the form of some vegan protein powder at the time. So by having a meal that had the protein, complex carbs, the fats, and fiber all together, that blunted the limit of my spike. But additionally, and more importantly, this brings us to point number two, which is exercise. I cycled immediately after having breakfast. So after breakfast, I would ride my bike to school and because I was always rushing and always trying to optimize every minute, I would ride pretty fast at a higher intensity. So that as well, if there was any spike from the smoothie, it would blunt that response because I'm quickly mobilizing the sugar to my muscles to use it for that exercise. Immediately after lunch, I would cycle straight to the gym. So again, I'm doing cardio plus the traditional strength training and that again would blunt my glycemic response. And then again, right before dinner, I would be cycling back home, picking up food, etc. So a couple things here. First of all, cardio, in my experience is more effective than strength training in terms of blunting your glycemic response. Second, breaking up the cardio into three 10 minute chunks, it was a lot easier to fit into my schedule, plus I was commuting, killing two birds with one stone, rather than just trying to cycle 30 minutes all at once. But the key thing here is that when I was exercising very close to when I was eating, that would blunt that spike. And by blunting the spike, I wasn't getting a food coma. Number three was managing stress effectively, and med school is obviously very stressful. So chronic stress increases your level of cortisol, and cortisol is this hormone that does a lot of things 
but as it relates to this conversation, it increases your glucose variability and excursion. Not a good thing. It means your glucose goes all over the place. So the things that I did to de-stress was number one, I was very regular about exercise. And then number two, I had a girlfriend who was also in med school with me. So it's good to have someone who can understand the struggle. Who, it's like a shared experience in a way. And then if you're in a relationship, there's also other ways to de-stress. And number four was avoiding caffeine. Now this is one of those chicken or the egg kind of phenomenons because I felt so good because everything else was dialed and I felt amped. I was constantly just high on energy and I didn't feel the need for any stimulants because other things were dialed in. But the tricky thing with caffeine is that if you feel tired, you may go for a cup of coffee or some delicious tea as I'm having right now. But the issue with that is that it increases the area under the curve of your glucose spike. And what that means is that you're gonna spike harder after having your coffee, assuming that you eat carbs in close proximity and that's gonna give you a worse food coma. You're gonna feel more tired after. Now this is especially relevant for those who love their pumpkin spice latte with extra caramel and extra whipped cream. <laughs> because you're combining the caffeine with that sugary hit, you're going to Spike City. And this is why you actually will paradoxically feel more tired after drinking your sugary coffee rather than feeling more energized. And this is one of the reasons why I opt for tea, which I'm convinced is the best drink for productivity. Lower levels of caffeine, more theanine, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't need sugar, tastes great. Anyways, you can learn more about it right up here. Now it wasn't all good. I did do several things wrong during medical school. And part of it was that I started med school at 21, right? And my physiology back then was much more resilient and tolerant of slight abuses. Whereas right now my body at 31, 10 years later is not as tolerant. So the first thing was eating too fast. That's definitely a bad habit I picked up from med school. Just like scarf down the food as quickly as possible, which actually causes you to spike a lot harder. Makes sense. You're getting that food, that bolus of food into your system, into your GI tract at a faster pace. I was able to get away with it though, because not only was I younger, but more importantly, I was exercising so much immediately after these meals. And secondly, I wasn't sleeping enough. And I feel like if you're in med school, you can totally relate. There are times no matter how effective you are, how good you are with your time management. Like if you need to be in the hospital at 4 a.m. and you don't get out until 9 p.m., you're not getting your eight hours of sleep, plain and simple. But I noticed back then I had these swings in productivity, right? So if I had one or maybe even two nights of extreme sleep deprivation, I'm sleeping like three, four hours a night, really not in an ideal space, I could survive with that. I could get away with that. But once I got past that, the productivity just like tanked. My ability to focus intensely for prolonged periods vanished. Okay, so next, what are the things that I've been doing wrong currently? First of all, I wanna say that these types of insights were only possible because I've been very obsessively tracking various biomarkers, whether it's my activity level, my HRV, my blood sugar, etc. And the most important tool that's actually shifted the needle the most in actually causing behavior change and greater insights into what is good and bad for me is this thing right here which is my levels CGM, continuous glucose monitor. So it tells me in real time what's happening with my blood sugar. And the really cool thing, the really powerful thing here is that it essentially acts downstream from these other really important habits, such as sleep or exercise or diet and stress. All of those factors get funneled into my CGM results. What's happening with my blood sugar is a reflection of my sleep, of my diet, of my exercise, and of my stress. Big thanks to Levels who are sponsoring this video. Now I actually use their product with my own cash. I loved it so much that I reached out to them after the fact, after using it for some time. And I said, hey, this is amazing. Can we work together? Can we do some collaborations on YouTube? And that's why we're here today. But keep in mind that our bodies are different and we actually do respond differently to various foods and behaviors. A food or behavior that is good for me could be bad for you and vice versa. So don't just blindly follow advice. Instead that experiment and track yourself, it actually becomes kind of a fun thing to do, in my personal opinion, and you'll get much better results that way. The way Levels works is you place their CGM on your arm, and over the next month, they have an app that helps you visualize the changes in your blood sugar, as well as track the foods, the exercise, the various habits that can influence your health. Again, it's truly one of my favorite tools that I've ever used when it comes to wearables or biowearables. And if you wanna try it out, then visit the link down in the description. That is gonna allow you to skip the line because there are literally tens of thousands of people on the waitlist List, but use that link, you'll skip the line. I think you'll like it. So some things I do now, they're definitely not as good as what I did back then. First of all, I'll eat breakfast around 11, 11.30, but I won't work out until 1.30 or two. Secondly, I'm not doing cardio three to four times per day like I was doing back then. I'm doing cardio like once or twice a week, if that. I'm also not sleeping enough, which granted at med school, a lot of the time I wasn't sleeping enough either, but I'm definitely noticing a hit in my glucose variability and excursion. And then finally, I feel like I'm not managing my stress as well today as I was back then, because back then, I don't know, like you're naive, you're 21 years old, you got your whole life ahead of you. You don't need to worry about like these existential crises and like your family getting older and, and whatnot. It was almost like ignorance is bliss in a way. And then you also had that shared camaraderie with other people going through the same experience with you. And that was, I have a lot of really fond memories from medical school, actually. All right, so the most important part 
what am I changing now and how am I gonna be better? So first of all is diet and my level CGM is definitely keeping me accountable. There have been times when I'm tempted to eat something tasty, some ice cream, some cookies, but I do something more responsible. So one of the things I love about wearing this CGM, can you see it right there? Is that it keeps me accountable. So right now it's almost midnight, hungry AF. And because of the CGM, I can't be eating junk food. I got amazing ice cream, amazing cookies, amazing chocolates. I got all these snacks on snacks on snacks. But because of this thing, I'm out here eating sardines and kimchi. This is especially true for the first meal of the day. When you have breakfast, you are breakfast, breaking the fast, right? So your GI tract is relatively empty. That means there's no food in front that's gonna slow it down. So if you have a crappy meal, you have your Pop-Tarts and pancakes, you're going straight to Spike City and boom, you're starting off the day straight with a food coma. So what I found is I'm actually much more sensitive with the first meal whenever I'm eating, whether it's 12 p.m. or whether it's 8 a.m., right? Whereas later in the day, I can get away with a little bit more because I have another bolus of food further down the GI tract that is slowing down digestion. Number two is I'm adding more cardio into my day. And back then it was easy because I was killing two birds with one stone. I was commuting as well as getting my exercise in at the same time. Nowadays, I work from home, so I can't do that. But the two things I'm doing is number one, I have a smart trainer inside my house. So rather than having to drive with my bike and then you know, set up and whatever, that takes you know, a couple hours, I can just go upstairs on my trainer and then cycle indoors. And then secondly, I'm actually walking after dinner, just walking around the neighborhood, which from my experience has been massively effective at blunting a blood sugar spike, even though you know, walking isn't very cardiovascularly intense. And number three is minimizing stress. And if I'm being honest, I don't have a super good plan here. The two things that I am relying on are number one, journaling more often, and then number two, reaching out to friends and family when I do feel like I need support. By making these changes, I've already noticed a massive improvement in how I feel day to day, both in my mood and my energy levels. I'm almost back to my med school level days in terms of productivity. So if you wanna improve your productivity or just your overall effectiveness in life, you need to focus on optimizing your physiology, get something like the levels that's gonna hold you accountable and give you those personalized insights. And with that, once you dial in your exercise, your nutrition, your diet, your stress, you're gonna feel better. And not only will you feel better, you'll live a happier, healthier, better life. Much love, and I'll see you guys in that next one.